Good morning. Here we are at the last uh, day, last track uh, of this course. Um, I think uh, that I've chosen to speak about uh, education, uh, and I think uh, that's uh, useful that uh, my input uh, appears, uh, it follows uh, Gary, uh, very interesting input uh, about ways of knowing. Uh, which uh, interests me a lot uh, and is useful because uh, although I'll address uh, the issue of education uh, and in particular former, formal education, meaning going to school, going to the university, I do not believe uh, that uh, we human beings uh, have uh, only one way of knowing uh, but uh, as uh, Kerry aptly pointed out, there are many ways of knowing. Actually, in my opinion, if any, it's undoubtedly that there are different ways of knowing. And to give an example, one way of knowing is a bodily experience. You know, my senses are all, you know, about way of knowing. But then, culture, tradition, conditioning, I interpret in a way or in another that kind of way of knowing. An example, uh, in the history of Catholic culture, from St. Augustine on, there was a, an incredible interpretation of bodily knowing concerning sexuality. Sexuality, that is an integral part of human experience, was interpreted as the devil. And people, to be virtuous, did they even wash themselves? Because if they wash themselves, they would be, you know, uh, more in touch with their body and so doing it with sexuality and devil. Well, nowadays, if somebody feeling that way, we would have uh, some psychopathological, you know, interpretation of that in terms of mental health. Another uh, way of knowing, as uh, Gary pointed out uh, with the help of example from Einstein and other scientists, is intuition, you know. And uh, in my opinion, uh, I want to say out loud, uh, Another way of knowing it is what we call metaphysics uh, and uh, spirituality and uh, communion uh, pantheism. Uh, com uh, but for me, what is science? In the evolution of human nature, what do we call in a outdated, politically incorrect way, homo sapiens, uh, like uh, there was uh, no woman sapiens <laughs> as well. Uh, science uh, doesn't come from Mars. Uh, to the person in the street, uh, sometimes uh, there is a, a misinterpretation. What is science and uh, what is education? Like it's truth. Far from it. In science, uh, the word truth is a dirty word. That is uh, the realm, uh, the field of metaphysics. In science, uh, there are experiences that we have directly with our senses uh, or indirectly with instruments uh, that are processes uh, to have a deeper input that then our senses permit, and then we integrate it cognitively our experience. So, if I have a telescope, you know, I interpret the images that I have through the telescope, that is just a prolongation of my eyes. If I go with a spaceship, with some astronaut to the moon, I'm just a take in my legs that carry me 
further than any on foot explorer can go to the discovery of the origin of the Nile of uh, another river. So science, uh, like uh, the experience uh, through the senses, uh, is that uh, we integrate uh, cognitively our experience, uh, but again, uh, we interpret always uh, in a colored way. There cannot be a neutral way. It's always colored. And all the input that I said before, I hope uh, to have shown uh, this uh, belief uh, that is uh, coming from sociology of knowledge, sociology of na- philosophy of science, etc., etc., psychology, uh, that uh, human beings do not live in reality. That's a, a very naive uh, uh, understanding of what is going on. We human beings live uh, in our construction of experience. It's always an interpretation. And that's why we have different culture, and that's why the culture changes continuously. As a matter of fact, somebody has said, I don't remember who, first, uh, the only thing that is uh, always stable in human society is continuous change. Although sometimes some society are much more stiff, rigid, threatened, so their change is much uh, slower and sometimes it appear to the person living in it uh, that is non-existent. So, also another thing about education. One thing is uh, formal education, but uh, certainly we don't start uh, with the education uh, informality. The first education we have uh, is uh, the classroom is the womb of our mother. We start to learn there, and it's scientifically proven that we absorb input, voice pattern, and of course, the, if the womb is belonging to a mother that is experiencing calm and happiness or stress. The first learning is inside our mother. Then we are born, and uh, people relate to us, how they stroke us, or do not stroke us. The tone of their voice is our first uh, classroom uh, outside the womb. And the language we learn, uh, you know, which has a lot of meaning and a value, is uh, the first, the second, the third the classroom. Then we learn uh, from how our family relates to each other and to the external world, and then our peers, and then finally we go to formal education. And uh, education, like uh, everything uh, that human beings uh, have, uh, can be, you know, more effective uh, to give us the possibility of survival and prosperity, or can actually sometimes be part of the problem. That's what I'm going to talk uh, today. One of our fellow and also recipient of Nobel Prize, uh, <clears throat> Paul Krusen, uh, has uh, said a uh, long time ago that uh, we live in the Anthropocene area because uh, all the human activities uh, put together are the primary uh, variable that is impacting uh, all the life form of this planet, not only human beings uh, but animals and plants. I hope it's clear to everybody that is listening that uh, there are mountain challenges that we human beings have to be faced. And uh, so we need uh, really solid base, uh, solid knowledge base, uh, solid tools. Uh, to have uh, a sustaini- sustainable global society. Now we are a global society, but uh, the way we behave it is uh, unsustainable. We destroy human capital, we destroy uh, environmental capital. So we need to re-examine uh, the dynamics of global economics as, uh, you know, 
Gary was showing us a green span. He didn't know how things uh, could go so bad uh, with the sub subprime tragedy. Because uh, his education, uh, his mindset uh, didn't allow that to happen. So it didn't exist. And uh, he said he was uh, flabbergasted, shocked. This could not happen. Indeed it did. And it's still continuing. Also at the political, human, social, cultural construct uh, that uh, we hold. This uh, to symbolize uh, some of the predicament. Not only polar bear see what is dramatically happening in their environment. We are all a polar bear in a, this kind of predicament, so to speak. And uh, Albert, Albert Einstein said it very eloquently. We cannot solve the problem of today at the level of thinking at which they were first created. We cannot use the education we received yesterday that had made us blind to create all this mess. That's my point. That is progress. And it's progressing too fast. It's choking us. That's how we are in touch with reality. Producing catastrophe, no end. So, we really need urgently to cope effectively with the challenge facing us. And I took a, a phrase that Gary says often, knowledge is the sustenance of civilization and culture. Education is the tool, the mean, with which each generation passes to the next, the knowledge has accumulated, and the wisdom acquired in the past. But sometimes we acquire the opposite. The ignorance accumulated in the past, and the dysfunctional knowledge <laughs> accumulated in the past. It's like a my parents die, and instead of uh, inheritance, uh, I inherit that. I owe a lot of money. Thanks, Pa. Thanks, Ma. <clears throat> of all the technologies developed by humanity, none is powerful and sophisticated as the means that we have developed to gather, organize, store, share, and transmit knowledge. It sounds very good, but we transmit also ignorance and dysfunctionality. So, education, maybe, if it's effective education, the instrument of conscious human evolution, but there can be also a way we are stuck in a quagmire. As the people that have followed would have noticed that I always put the good, but also the bad. It's not that I'm enamored of the bad, it's that I'm not blind. There is so much bad stuff, but if you want to do good, you have to consider, because it's going to tell you where to change. So, now, there are tons of scientific evidence that our relationship with ourselves others and the planet that we live uh, is the main variable in terms of the aspect of our lives. In the last 20 years, uh, the people that had the denial of cognitive dissonance or they were paid by the polluting industries uh, to say false statement uh, have dwindled because what is happening? You know, we started to suffer a lot from climate change. So people are, you know, starting to worry how we're going to deal with this. So, I think uh, we need to see, think, act uh, systemically, interdisciplinarily, transdisciplinarily, and uh, intersectorially, not just uh, one piecemeal at a time. 
Education, of course, uh, in, together with the family, you know, in printing uh, and culture, plays a, a very crucial role in the construction of reality. Uh, and to me and to my colleague of the World Academy of Modern Science, uh, it's more and more evident that we need a, a paradigm change because the tools that we possess uh, to diagnose and uh, uh, operate on reality is clear they are not effective. So we need uh, a paradigm change because the paradigm change happens uh, when uh, the tools you have uh, don't allow you to uh, uh, make a prediction uh, to and to govern uh, events. You know, uh, we need uh, to understand uh, and to have tools that uh, would be effective in dealing uh, with what we need to deal. So, if we don't have the knowledge and uh, tools, uh, we're not gonna we're gonna be condemned to impotency. So we need to retool, not to throw everything uh, to the sea, but uh, we need uh, to organize better and uh, see our blind spots uh, and uh, have a better way to deal. First of all, to be aware. Awareness is the name of the game. Awareness is not uh, just uh, found uh, in a spiritual teaching. Awareness uh, is uh, the name of the game uh, in uh, science as well and in daily life uh, of mature people. A mature person is a person that is more aware of an immature person. So, we need to create a new paradigm of education also. A general education paradigm of ways of knowing, but also we need to better our education if education has to serve people's need. You know, today, I'll go deeper into this, we have a lot of people coming out of the university process and they are awarded a doctorate in so-and-so, but that doctorate enable these people really to see and effectively deal with the, what they are doctor about? I don't think so. I'll uh, expand on that. If they were able, they would do it. So, we need an education that is effective and relevant uh, for public service, uh, for social responsibility, and uh, for sustainable governments uh, and development to deal with reality and grow further. Why? Because it's imperative. We need it to be more effectively able to protect and promote human and capital environment of capital. Why? Because we've been destroying human and environmental capital like uh, is uh, a positive thing. It's incredible. We cannot afford it to be so destructive. So, we need to think uh, globally and act locally in effective ways. Uh, and to do so, we need people that have the knowledge, skill, and competence to operate uh, at intersectional and the inter interdisciplinary level, at all the levels social, cultural, environmental, economic. Uh, psychological and spiritual. And so, how the people that got a, a PhD, a doctorate, uh, can do this? Well, that's exactly I teach uh, at the post graduate level, and that's really where the problem is uh, that I'm talking about. I'll uh, here use uh, the words uh, of uh, a well uh, exponent of sociology of the profession. Uh, <clears throat> that's a, 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 a field of sociology that, uh, interesting enough, uh, is not really welcome because it shows what is going on at the profession. Are the profession really uh, what they claim to be? What is a profession? A professional is a person uh, that has knowledge and skill to profess, to profess, so to act over in science and conscience, uh, 
for the best of uh, his client, that be a state, a city, a community, or a single citizen. But do we uh, uh, have a competent professional? I think that, unfortunately, the competence uh, that uh, we form our professional is uh, largely obsolete. Why? Various professionals are still construed by using outmoded, mechanistic, reductionist division of the traditional fields of expertise. I teach, as I said, to the postgraduate level. So, many of my so-called students, uh, learners, are medical doctors and clinical psychologists. Most of them, they are, you know, kind of young people. Uh, they are around 30 years old. And now they come out of the university and they seem so pretty sure of what they know and they have learned. So I give them to read the first five days of my teaching, I give them as a, the most important assignment a little book, a paperback, that was written by a physicist, Fischer Capra, that I know, and it's a great popularizer of uh, uh, scientific knowledge, and is a uh, uh, the turning point. And he published that book in 68. He has written many other books. But I give that on purpose to people and say, raise your hand if you were not born in 68 when this book was published. Almost all the hands go up. Now, read this book that cost 8 euro and uh, Underline in yellow, green, or whatever color you are, the notion that this author brings uh, to bring uh, anybody, the man in the street, the housewife, people in vacation, to read uh, e an easy book uh, that tells you what is going on uh, in science and in paradise. And uh, underline in yellow, everything that they didn't teach you in school many years before. And tell me, so how many obsolete notions they taught you as there was the scientific knowledge of the time, much later than 60 years, you went to school and you got a doctorate and updated your knowledge. They are coming back to flabbergast because their book is full of yellow. That yellow is a shame on education that is dysfunctional. And uh, telling people something that we know is obsolete would be like treating a patient. It's not even ethical. It's like treating a patient without uh, having the best uh, knowledge uh, that uh, medicine can offer to treat uh, a condition. So, I agree strongly with Abbott uh, that uh, the way, dysfunctional way that uh, we give uh, our new professional uh, obsolete knowledge uh, is uh, that uh, it's been a, a very conservative uh, field uh, they want to construe socially professional meaning uh, the university process. Uh, it, re it is a blueprint of uh, what it was going a long time ago, when the single discipline uh, uh, are stifled, not by knowledge, but power interest. So they were, like in India in the past, uh, people were divided by caste, uh, you know, they are transparent uh, reflecting a caste system of the power lines uh, of the guilds of the corporation, 
nothing to do with the operating and professing in science and conscience the best for the service user. Uh, nothing of this has uh, to do with offering the best service uh, that we could uh, to society and uh, instead to reflect uh, the power struggle among the competing professional corporation and guild. If we don't understand that things don't happen by chance, that, you know, basically they are fear, they are turf detention, and uh, we have to identify where the blockage, where the barrier to get past. Let me make another example. Thank God, or thank you to men, kind, humankind, student numbers have been rising in many countries since the 1800s. I remember Giannani mentioning this in some other conference. I copied it from your slides. And UNESCO estimates that in the 1900, there were only half a million students enrolled in university worldwide. One century later, which means 14 years ago, <laughs> we have 100 million students enrolled. Wow, you can say. What a progress. 2,000% increase. Well, in terms of quantity, Chapeau, congratulations. But are we sure that we have increased the quality and not just the quantity? I think, unfortunately, that we have increased the quantity, but not enough the quality of the education that people receive in the university. Why? Because we certify people are competent in their field, but really, they are not uh, competent uh, to deal with the, what the, their degree says that they are supposed to do, because they are still trained uh, mechanistically knowledge. Let me say something very bluntly. We put a lot of economic and society resources to socially construe a medical doctor. That doctor knows a lot about pathology, and how to treat them with the biomedical uh, approach uh, a dysfunctional organ. He doesn't know, not the, thanks to his university training, how to relate to the person and to the hope and the fear of that patient and his family members. He doesn't have a training in uh, establishing an effective working alliance with the patient and the family, of respecting the culture of that person and family. And more than anything, it had not teach how to prevent a conflict with the team of a health professional that he would have to be integrated and to function with. So, the training we give to doctor is pretty uh, lacking in this regard. We give a PhD to a psychologist that is going to be psychotherapy. Do we train that person well enough? I do not think so. Why? Because uh, uh, psychology is largely preoccupied to copycat medicine and use the same measure of medicine in a mechanistic, reductionistic way to show that we really a science. You know, if uh, it was a, a patient in therapy, we would help the person uh, to overcome uh, this inferiority complex. Instead, uh, we act now uh, for limiting ourselves. If he's an economist, tell me, do economists understand the economy? Why? Well, the worldwide results of their understanding are clearly showing the mess in which we are. We do not even teach the right metrics. 
we don't have the, the metrics uh, to measure effective reality. And you call this education? Often, we damage people in believing they know when they are actually blind. And being blind and be sure that they know what uh, they have to do, creating sometimes even more problems. Because if one has, is aware of his lack of knowledge, uh, we we'll try to figure it out. Now, we go very sure into the abyss. So, in my opinion, education to be more effective really needs to become so. And so, a shift of paradigm, but it means a betterment on the effective capacity of education. So, I would say, from studying by rote subjects uh, to be centered on the people, on the learner, student-centered. The other day I was showing the input that how the research showed that being student-centered is more effective than for learning. So from passive to active learning. Learning should be mm, something juicy, good, like eating uh, the summer a juicy apple, a juicy peach, with all the juice falling, and has to be sexy, has to be a passion. I want the education where I want to jump and swim into knowledge, not by road, not really dead learning. Uh, so, from memorization to understanding, thinking uh, actively, use those muscles, uh, you know, original thinking, creative thinking. <clears throat> so from information and, and mental understanding to the development in school system of the whole person. From uh, the ivory tower of academic uh, theoretical to life-centered knowledge. Let's face it. I know university system around the world and not our self-serving power structure of uh, the academician. They're not really centered uh, to serve uh, the purpose that uh, why we use uh, our resources. If we don't show this uh, power structure, we're not gonna, we're gonna get uh, around it. So, from fragmented and mechanistic knowledge to integrated knowledge, and a shift from creating standardized products of education. Now you know there is a new, even worse, uh, corporation, a fine university college, uh, and mass producing uh, artificial knowledge uh, like is a, uh, you know, canned meat. You know, uh, if you talk about knowledge, uh, you have uh, to think most uh, about teacher effectiveness. And again, I want to mention doing long time ago that said the problem with education is there are too many, way too many teachers and very few facilitators of learning. That's it. We waste the human capital of our learners just by putting them, you know, wanting to have them become rigidified, yes sir, yes ma'am, into mass production of knowledge. We have to personalize knowledge. So, creativity is a squish out a skill in this kind of uh, situation. So, I think uh, system theory Keeping in mind also the limitation, nothing is a panacea, nothing is a magic. But we need a, a paradigm that allows for continual change, that for the flow, the psychosocial paradigm, and also everything focus on the whole purpose. So we need that to be people-centered, community-centered, culture-centered. Anyhow, all the stakeholders. That's, I think, important. A systemic vision has to bring not only the academician, not only the scientists, but 
everybody involved because we are all involved in this plan. <clears throat> it would be actually interesting, uh, like uh, the Native American uh, sensibly said, that if we could communicate uh, with animals and trees, what kind of suggestion they would give us? But anyhow, what I'm saying, uh, very realistic, we will not have a new effective paradigm, bring it together, only top university. Of course, uh, we want them, they are very important, but they cannot be the only one. If they were, would be sufficient to have a top uh, academician, we already would not speak about this problem. They would have to help us just to solve it. We need to bring together all the stakeholders, meaning all the component uh, social actor, component of society, and create a virtuous process. One that would generate an effective understanding and offer effective solution to the problem society must face, and also the future problem. <clears throat> we need this all to develop a new paradigm in education and develop updated and effective research, effective education, effective knowledge. And we need to bring and build a reservoir of best practice. Through what? So many pilot projects. No solution is going to be for all, but if we can experiment and learn from the results. I think with the humility that uh, there are so many little projects uh, everywhere, in many countries, uh, you know, barefooted uh, uh, teachers uh, going uh, to the field uh, to promote uh, that kind of learning. And also, in our small ways, uh, the World Academy of Art and Science, uh, the one that has uh, as mission statement and slogan, unity in diversity, has uh, recently uh, felt that that is also our responsibility, not just to say these things, uh, but try to walk our talk. And so we have created uh, this new, budding, but growing uh, institution that is the World University Consortium that is uh, being created to facilitate the process. We don't have uh, secret knowledge uh, to give. It would be so narcissistic and, and preposterous to think. But we want to be facilitator. Facilitator of learning in the Dewey, you know, sense. Uh, we want to bring it all together and facilitate a process of cross-pollination and knowledge of creation and sharing through interactive, through relationship, effective relationship, it create an international, as we're doing, network, open to all the stakeholders that they have, you know, open heart and clear intention and common value to not get richer, but to benefit and serve the global society, to enhance the diversity, because it's a richness, to share ideas, to share expertise, and to learn from each other, and to share best practices, open to all. <clears throat> and uh, our commitment in shared values uh, are grounded uh, on equal rights, equal opportunities, freedom, creativity and excellence in research, scholarship, and sustainable education. On passing, I would say that uh, uh, the, our academy is uh, participating to the United Nations uh, Academic uh, Charter, and uh, we fully share those values and those aims. So, 
World University Consortium aims to address cultural, environmental, social issues of common interest to world community by promoting partnership through university, local government, local community, business community, and all the non-profit sector. Basically, everybody that share the same ideals is welcome. And to facilitate that process, we want to create a safe, safe space where people can be just themselves. They, where we can look in each other's eyes, so to speak, and be honest, bring what we have without needing to pretend to bring any pre good solution. And wanting to learn from each other to get richer on a win-win basis. And this uh, to the purpose uh, to give a more effective uh, uh, answer to the needs uh, that society needs at the global and local level. So, our plan is uh, to have a virtuous process where everybody will be empowered and uh, facilitate to cooperate with the others uh, effectively and develop new knowledge <coughs> and new opportunity to protect and promote human capital. Here, from our uh, web space, uh, I want to briefly cite uh, some of the main objectives, create a global power to be person, community, culture, center, to create a depository open freely to all of best practice, to explore and better the hybrid system, you know, that uh, moves uh, just uh, being online uh, doesn't really uh, work uh, because the uh, human being, uh, you need the human relationship, uh, so the so-called hybrid uh, system uh, uh, works better because give uh, real interaction. Uh, in everything we do, we want uh, the value to be transparent. So people can share or not. Uh, we want uh, an open learning system and create also new metric. So we will be really motivated uh, to create, uh, together with all the others, uh, new models of cooperation in education, teaching, research, the application of research, the management of new projects, uh, and uh, create also better responsible leadership. To do so, we are in the process of creating the large ever biggest action research project ever created on this planet. Bringing together all the stakeholders and be everybody equal and taking the process to learn by doing it. The aim is to promote the effective scientific advancement, civil and social responsibility and uh, empowering everybody that participate to create and share new knowledge. So, you know, we are only interested in people that want to be collaborating and not uh, keeping just for themselves uh, what uh, we would discover together. Sharing is uh, important, which means, uh, like Gary was saying, that uh, the power, the energy is flowing is not blocked. So, new knowledge, but also building bridges. You know, we want to build long bridge so people and different disciplines can come together, learn from each other, cross pollinate and grow in awareness. We really want uh, to go west, uh, so to speak, uh, enlarge the frontiers of human understanding, uh, 
creating new knowledge uh, through collaboration in research and innovation. So, we want a win-win. Uh, competition here is a competition to share, who share more. Uh, in terms of organization, you know, we are a non-profit, non-governmental, international, interdisciplinary, intersectoral, international body to promoting the value and practice and the promotion and protection of human capital, human rights, reciprocal understanding, synergic collaboration, sustainable development, protection and promotion of biodiversity and diversity of people. We don't want to have uh, everybody in the same kind of box. So we want to promote uh, synergy among uh, all the stakeholders, uh, capacity building, protecting difference, person-centered approaches, student-centered approaches, community-centered approaches, <coughs> people-centered approach, protect and promote human rights, develop intercultural, empathetic understanding and respect, socially and environmental sustainable intervention, and effective collaboration with all the United Nations agencies. We already, some of us, uh, certainly Gary, Ivo and many of us were at the United Nations in last uh, September, the last year, and uh, Janani, uh, uh, and uh, we're going to probably do a second, uh, because uh, we had found that, that uh, at the time, the Secretary General to be very interested in what uh, we have uh, to propose, and we have found that all over the world that we have done uh, a University of California Berkeley conference uh, and many other conferences uh, the, around the world, uh, Washington, uh, Ottawa, we were in Baku. We find a lot of interest in this project because people of all walks of life uh, and government uh, is becoming very worried. We don't know what is going on, we don't have the tools to decode uh, or uh, manage uh, the new emergencies. So. Summing up, in the so-called Anthropocene area, facilitating the development of a new paradigm in effective education, to have a fully functioning professional, person, family, group, organization, and communities, not only is a bit of importance for human welfare, perhaps we need this for the entire planet. So, good luck at all of us, and thank you. Bravo. That was really inspiring. Wonderful. Thank you. Let's hope that is inspiring uh, the aim, uh, actually, for all humanity, because we badly need it, uh, and we don't have it. Uh, thousands of years uh, to develop this. Though I have heard you a number of times talk on this subject, and we have been discussing it, and much of what you said is what we have worked on together. One of the advantages that I see of doing it in this course has been when you put this all together in the, and put the world in, I'm really glad you put this topic on the last day. Because when you see how much our problems are problems of a social construction uh, and how, because your, your practical experience in the professions, you see how much we're still living in the past, uh, by the past blinders and the past... Uh, when we started the World University Consortium, I must, you know, my attention was very much on the quantitative challenge, even though I knew there's much more beyond that. And as we went on and we discussed the qualitative challenge, but really, I come away from listening to you here, 
more deeply convinced that the real contribution we need to make is on neither the quantity nor quality per se, but on the new perspective, which is really what we call the new paradigm. And you made the case in such an inspiring way. I wish we had this on the tent anyway, because this is a message that can really, should really go to the world. And you have the passion and eloquence in expressing it. So it was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you also for, for a very passionate presentation. And it is uh, easily perceived that this is what you are living in and for. And could you please specify um, if, uh, about the uh, present uh, network of the organizations and institutions uh, which are already in the pro project of the World University Consortium? Sure. <coughs> Basically, uh, what uh, has happened, because it's a very recent, uh, you know, it's a, a near old uh, baby, is, we've been talking uh, for more, but uh, the foundation, uh, uh, and uh, so we have, uh, by the way, I want to underline, wisely, the word uh, Academy of Art and Science, this is a project uh, that uh, has been generated uh, by some of us uh, in the World Academy. But uh, wisely so, the Board of Trustees and the Executive Board uh, wanted not to own uh, the project because uh, we think uh, that this is really needed, so it should be everybody project. So this is uh, a project uh, that is uh, standing on its own legs uh, And the World Academy of Science that showed the wisdom and the humility is one of the founders, one of the charter members. But they equally, you know, <laughs> is also uh, other organization like International University Consortium here in Dubrovnik. They are charter members. We are... Uh, You know, charter member is uh, the Green Cross, the Mother Society, and, and many others, uh, and mother, many others uh, institutions that really share the value and really feel the urgency of uh, this. Now, we are in the process, uh, and I tell you, you know, both the uh, foundation, if interested, could uh, certainly uh, would be welcome to partake uh, this common challenge, uh, and uh, you in person. Uh, but uh, now we opening again. Uh, you know, we really do not have anything against the university. Most of us are part, <laughs> but uh, just because we know, we want uh, to help a university that at the University of Berkeley, where we had uh, this conference, uh, a lot of university come. They are very worried, because they know that things are changing, times are changing, like uh, <laughs> the <coughs> song uh, was saying, and they are very worried. And uh, I think uh, we would uh, really offer university, research institution, and all the stakeholders uh, a way, finally, in a neutral search, search, to really listen to each other and uh, to synergize with each other. Because I have seen it uh, in so many uh, occasions. It's not facilitating our culture, but when there is a facilitating environment and people put down their fear, and really listen to each other, we can do wonders. We are wonderful when we give ourselves uh, the opportunity to be, but uh, we need a facilitating environment. And so now there are universities and other, you know, uh, uh, non-profit organizations joining 
But uh, what is, I think, uh, remarkable is that uh, we found, that's my, I don't know, Gary, Gary <laughs> can tell his opinion, uh, but uh, we've been uh, encouraged that every way we go, with every kind of person that we speak, and we speak, uh, you know, with people like the Club of Madrid, uh, where they are head of state, diplomats, or foreign, everybody's in agreement. What we know is not working anymore. We badly need uh, better understanding, better diagnosis, and better uh, operational tools to deal with the emergency we are in. And so, I hope uh, that uh, we will be able to facilitate uh, the involvement uh, and the active participation of not just uh, white Western uh, uh, people or institution, but the whole planet. I think, uh, personally, that we live, that not uh, to think uh, that we have a lot to teach uh, with others, I don't feel so. I think uh, we have a lot to learn uh, from each other. If instead of pre good teaching to give uh, to the heathen, we started to be a little more humble, a little bit more wise, and uh, just the fact uh, to have uh, a safe space where we facilitate communication with common goal, I think uh, that is uh, evolutionary. That's uh, the evolution of consciousness uh, that I'm talking about. Uh, and that's really having not just talk, uh, but doing it uh, and being connected uh, with different culture, different people. So, in this case, we need uh, also the man in the street. Why? Because it's evident. You know, Building it are built by architects that never had to live in those buildings. If they had to live in those buildings, they would be with the different hospitals are built not by people that would stay in bed and have the treatment. You know, we need to have a more just a people centered. A lot of the dysfunction is that we do not think that they are keeping the people in mind, it's just abstract theory. So, uh, we are very few at the moment, uh, but growing, actually, <laughs> sometimes we feel, oh, oh, oh what uh, we are proposing, enormously uh, positive feedback. But the interest from the uh, Western European countries should be uh, bigger, I guess, because uh, these countries uh, do not actually have so many inside prob prob problems and for example the post-Soviet countries could be um, more difficultly involved because they are so very concerned with the uh, inner pro problems like I'm speaking about Ukraine, I'm speaking about some even some countries of the European Union like Greece and Romania and well, can I say, well, uh, not totally, thank God, uh, because, uh, for example, at the moment, uh, we have uh, some research project uh, to bring this to fruition, and the head uh, is Egypt uh, with the Biblioteca Alessandrina, mm -hmm. and we have uh, projects of what are we talking about uh, in uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina, and uh, in uh, uh, some city like uh, Ljubljana in proposal, and uh, uh, we were discussing this in Baku. Uh, so I think uh, I, I would like uh, to hear uh, Gary travels uh, around the world even more than him to preach uh, this new gospel, and uh, you feel that the, the former communist country are, don't have much interest in that uh, uh, the West and the European country have more interest? That uh, was the point, right? I think it's a, a very good question. I think in one sense uh, the rest of the world looks to Europe and North America as an ideal and is doing its best to emulate and imitate 
what's there, uh, which is what capitalism looked like to the communist world <laughs> at the point of transition, and then when they found out actually how it works, a lot of that idealism vanished very quickly, and then where did we get ourselves into here? So I think in one sense you're right that from the outside, not so much because the, these countries are having problems, we are having our problems too, but because from a distance it looks like the answer, they've got the answer to everything. Uh, whereas when you go inside and you talk to people who are not just satisfied with their high achievements, uh, you know, one of the striking things we heard at the in, we did some research before the Berkeley conference, went around to people at Berkeley, Stanford, and other places in Compton, uh, and they confessed, these were the people who really see a need for change in education, they confessed that here in these universities, which are supposed to be the epitomes of, you know, of higher knowledge and all, that, I'm, I'm quoting actually somebody, we have spent so much time on focusing on the knowledge we want to transfer and tell them we really know very little about the process of education. These are top American universities saying, we know what we want to teach, we really don't know much about how people learn and what have we been doing for all of these decades. And, uh, I'm, an encouraging thing for us is the first university to join our consortium, because we started out with non-universities, others involved. The first one is from Kazakhstan. So in one sense, uh, I think there's a greater openness to learn by those who are outside of this area. There's so much a sense, the whole, when the whole world up, looks up to you and admires you, it's very hard to find fault with yourself. Uh, uh, and though sincere people there are who know the limitations of from the inside. So I think that uh, the other saving grace maybe, it's impossible to duplicate, even if it were desired, it's impossible to duplicate the Western system everywhere in the world because it's so inefficient in delivering knowledge uh, to people. So I think by circumstances we're going to be compelled to, uh, to switch. We were in, uh, 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 in Brasilia in, uh, uh, I guess it was May, uh, and uh, with a group of economists, mostly from Latin America, but they were coming from Europe and other places. And these were economists who, in their own field, would, would say, in fact, when I, we talked about the university consortium, they agreed entirely on the need for a new paradigm. They are fully aware, I don't mean all economists are, but these people were fully aware of the need uh, uh, for, for new perspectives and getting out of the blinders that it doesn't work. I think that may be more true in Latin America. You know, maybe that's something, I don't know enough about the region, but I was very impressed by the openness of the, uh, the people then. So we don't really know where we're going to get. We were in Japan, the, one of our founding charter members is the uh, International Association of University Presidents. And it was very, the most, I went to their triannual conference. They had 450 heads of university. One of the most fascinating things I heard was we were talking to the then president of the association, who's now the chairman of the board, who's on our board, and when we were talking about the issues we wanted to discuss, discuss at the conference, which is really about the future of education, not how to get students or how to balance the budget, but the new education, he said these are very important things. None of our Meetings are concerned with these things. When we get together, we're not thinking about the future. And uh, when I started saying something like Alberto said about the present system is under siege and it has to change, oh, I don't think we should say that in the meeting. Well, they got a, a former chairman of Sony, I forget his name, very 
hire a man who really raised Sony uh, over a 20 year period, raised it to the status that it achieved. Uh, and he got up there and he said, uh, 65 million years ago, an asteroid crashed to the Earth and it destroyed the dinosaurs. And uh, there's an asteroid headed for global higher education. What he did say, which would have been a better argument actually for him, is that it's that asteroid that made possible the rise of human life on it. <laughs> and I think that's very true. The, the, whatever destruction is coming is going to release the humanity in education in what a really a human-centered education should be. So I can't say we had a lot of enthusiasm. We had enthusiasm from people in Korea. You know, where they're, where they're really focusing on education and agree on the need for something new. Uh, even with some old university in Japan. So I don't really know. I think it's going to be, depend more on the individual insight, you know, than the geography. Uh, but, uh, but I think that one of the saving graces is that uh, there's no way that countries in this region can raise themselves by duplicating that system. We've got to find a better system, and there is definitely a better way to do this. Uh, and we've got to let some fresh air in uh, the windows. And you know, this course itself is an outcome of that. We're trying to. This is an experiment. Uh, we really recognize the need to link the knowledge to the application, to link the disciplines to each other in a creative way, to try to get to something more fundamental. And next week, we're going to do it uh, in, in a different way. And we think this is the kind of thing we'd like to be promoting, not just the teaching methods, uh, but uh, uh, and the basic uh, concepts, but new perspectives on how we can overcome the reductionism, how we can overcome the mechanism, the mechanisms and all. And uh, I think there are people around the world who feel that way, and we hope that, uh, that the consortium will be a, uh, a gathering point, a focal point to attract those. It's obviously not going to be many in the mainstream to begin with, but uh, let's, let's be a point of focus for those who really feel the need for a new, new paradigm and see what can come of it. We're excited about the possibilities. We're not, uh, we're not naive as, in terms of the magnitude of the challenge, but we're encouraged also by some of the responses we've had so far. Thank you. And I would also like to phrase about the, that we should include studies of intuition into the courses, so we have to study how to be more intuitive, because it seems that uh, many uh, great inventions were made um, thanks to the intuition, and it's really not taught and not. Uh, isn't isn't it ironic? No. I, I, it seems to me that when I realize that it's so ironic that the great scientists themselves say it's not the scientific method that led to the discoveries. I don't say that you should <laughs> abandon the scientific method. But should we also be trying to understand the intuitive side of it uh, and trying to propagate it and encourage it? Uh, it's really interesting how uh, we go about things. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you. Really enjoyed that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, please. Hey, uh, I have actually one question. Uh, okay, we discovered actually uh, that any of being, I, I, I thought actually that Berkeley is the member of World Consortium, isn't it? No. Okay, and now is my question is it really possible to change something without support of big ones, of Berkeley? Uh, Harvard, um, I, I'm almost sure uh, we need to involve them without support of the biggest one. You know, always when I teach something and I teach at university in Hamburg or here, you know, always I mention 
that I teach something in Cambridge. And I teach really only Chelsea Seminar, you know. I don't say I teach uh, in Zagreb or in Aussie because it's small ones, huh? But not really, okay, of course it's important for me, for my students and so on, but, you know, always to say I teach at Cambridge, for example. Um, and I think to get um, some kind of support of these big universities, um, most important universities, will help to share idea. It's not only to be recognized by them, it's actually to possibility to share ideas. They have really big network, big alumni, very influential alumni, and I'm almost sure um, that it will be actually a good idea to have support of them. The second is the question, what do you think about the possibility to have one place? Uh, for regular meetings. It's better to have uh, regular meetings in different uh, places in the world or have one place where you say, okay, that's our, uh, our table, our seat, and always, if you want to call me, please call me here. It's my, uh, you know, it was this uh, famous uh, question Okay, I want to call Europe. What is the um, call now to Europe? So maybe you need to have, maybe we need to have some call number, you know, to have one place. And always, um, if you organize something, you organize in this place, and everyone from the car or from Tokyo, they know, ah, they are the our guys from Chennai or I don't know which place. It's only the question, is this maybe easy way uh, to have somebody who will be secretary, a general secretary in the mean technical support, because all ideas describe really great ideas, you know. Uh, last couple of days we had so many good lectures, so many good ideas, but somebody need really to want to share it. To answer your question, uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, we are actually hitting of a mountain perceived need, so I don't think we need to worry if uh, the good names uh, would join in, they already join. We have uh, the association uh, of uh, university president uh, and university rector that uh, is uh, already <laughs> hundreds uh, of uh, you know, one of uh, our charter members is Duke, and that's uh, another uh, 107 university. Uh, in uh, the end of the month, uh, I'm going to Poland because uh, the uh, Compostela Consortium University that has uh, like uh, around uh, 70, 80, I don't remember exactly, uh, University of Central or South America invited us uh, because they want to explore a possibility of uh, uh, a collaboration. I would say that in my perception uh, the most uh, big mistake that we could do is to have too many universities at this point. Uh, because uh, again, as I said, I'm convinced that if the university were part of the solution, they already had the provider for it. What we want to really look for is not the famous university. That they would come without problem because it's in their interest. They're already perceiving that uh, there is to become like the dinosaur of the past. What we really need to, to be aware of our responsibility of creating really a safe and a facilitating environment for all the stakeholders. So I think uh, we should be worried about uh, being able to attract uh, people that usually they never ask uh, what would be the next education. And uh, not just the majorities, the minorities, because uh, we are not uh, going to go out of the trap uh, if we don't include all the stakeholders. So the least uh, worry I have uh, personally is uh, getting a university. That's easy. <laughs> I want uh, to have uh, uh, the underdogs, 
the one that nobody wants to listen at some time uh, to bring their input. I want to have uh, uh, the voices that we all ignore, and by ignoring, uh, we do not have a solution uh, that reflect the reality. That's a wonderful question. The other thing of the essential spot is too early for me to answer that. It would be very attractive. Actually, we have uh, several offers, but I don't think it would be so wise uh, to accept uh, because no matter where you are, you make a statement. And where we want to be is planet Earth. So if uh, we would be in a spot, uh, I think it would be a mistake. We want to be at least uh, in the five continents, uh, not in one. It would be very uh, mistaken uh, to be uh, with this kind of proposal in a, a European or North American country, and that this is again a white male, uh, you know, kind of project. It cannot win on this basis. It has to be really facilitating this path. So. If a, a spot should be, I would say it has to be multi-spot because that is a transdisciplinary and transorganizational. Uh, and uh, by the way, to reassure you, we have already plenty of number and we have any time uh, of the workday somebody that uh, would answer your concern. We don't are short, and this is also a great thing. We are not short of people really believing in this. And let me, maybe it's not appropriate now, but I think so. We are, you know, strange people. But the, for example, here is present Jacobs and the Mother Society. They've been working tirelessly for free, often donating money. You know, we seem to attract people that uh, are willing uh, to, we all travel, pay, uh, you know, bowers. In a sense, uh, you know, to be not uh, really well-founded uh, with great uh, buildings, I think uh, we should be proud of it, uh, and that's one of our strengths. Not that uh, we will need uh, money in terms of energy, because we plan uh, to give away to share knowledge. So, to give you an example, I would be very happy when they be very successful, not to be at the Harvard or Oxford. We're going to be there. That's that. We already organized a conference at UC Berkeley. That's not the problem. A great moment of this idea is when we're going to be able to offer free education of uh, sustainable entrepreneurship uh, in villages that do not have an entry. Because enormous uh, human potential is being wasted uh, by people that uh, don't have access to the university, to internet, and uh, there is a, a lot of contribution to those people. So we want to empower those people. That uh, would uh, show that we are not another university and that uh, we really walking our talk. Otherwise, if this is going to be another old boys club uh, of privileged people that have a good heart, uh, but they would remain uh, comfy. Uh, that's not uh, what our project is. Uh, and so, uh, in my opinion, the moment that we are well established <laughs> and we, our headquarters uh, are in a powerful building, we missed uh, to really act upon uh, of what is our. Then, uh, in uh, five years, ten years, I predict uh, that if we are successful, so many people would offer and uh, would be honored to host us uh, and to have partnership with us uh, that we would be uh, in many buildings uh, in many continents of the Earth. But certainly not one. Um, that's my uh, reply, of course. I am uh, in the actual board of directors uh, and uh, I have uh, one vote. <laughs> but uh, I think uh, we are pretty much uh, on the same wavelength. We really want to do a humble service uh, to the time and history we are. We don't want to become bigger, we don't want to even become famous. 
We want to be able to empower people, the people that don't have a voice, the people that don't have a, a role. That's uh, the revolutionary. I wouldn't say, by the way, revolutionary. I don't want to do anything revolutionary. This has been done a thousand times, and all the revolution replicate the effects of what they want to eliminate. We want a more equal opportunity in growing to tackle the common problems. That's my answer. Maybe uh, you have a different... I agree with everything Alberto said, and I just complimented with a few comments. When he talked about all the stakeholders, for example, which he spoke about and then reiterated here, an example, we had an invitation, we had an invitation from the University of Ljubljana for a major international conference on all the themes that uh, he said. Uh, we went and met with the mayor of Ljubljana and talked about, and the minister of education and said, look, we want to also look at how well is the university serving the interests of the society, of the community? How, long, how well is it addressing the issue of employment, the issue of health care, uh, the issue of the environment and all? Because the university is a social institution. And our concept, and we had much greater enthusiasm among the mayor, you know, to the university as an institution which has been largely isolated from social responsibility. All I do is educate people, then the rest takes care of itself. We're, trying, we're talking about a different concept. And therefore, we can't make this just a group of universities, but I can tell you, I've been meeting with them. I, I listened to them for three days in uh, Japan uh, uh, in June. Uh, they're still living in their isolation. How am I going to get more students? How am I going to get more revenue? They're still thinking from the point of view of the universities. So that's one reason for it. Certainly, I think we're all enamored of the prestige of a Berkeley, a Harvard, a Oxford, a Cambridge, and we all understand how that works in normal things in society. I have a doubt, though, when you really want to bring about significant change. Uh, whether, how often have really important changes in society been done by the institutions which were at the heart and peak of the existing model? If you look back historically, how long, that's not our, my experience. Uh, the experience is that it comes from what looks like the fringe. The whole of Silicon Valley was a fringe of American industry in 1970. The whole PC industry didn't come, didn't get developed because of IBM and Univac and uh, Sperry and the you know handful of computer companies that were really uh, big, uh, Cray or Ridge Search or any of those. It came from a whole new set of startups who didn't have their vested interest in looking at things the way Tom Watson did. I think there were five, you know, and he provides, speaking of this big centralized monolithic thing. Uh, what, what happened with the internet? Ironically, it's not Microsoft it's not even Microsoft or Apple that, you know, pioneered the Internet. Though no company would be better placed to take off and pioneer the Internet but Microsoft. Bill Gates has been quoted. I didn't put that in there because he's been quoted very often. But he said in 1995, you know, that he didn't really think the, the Internet was going to significantly impact their business model or, or anything like that. It's not that he's a fool. It comes from, in fact, one of the, and take it only as an analogy, not an example. In the U.S. in 1994-95, we had a company, we still have a company, Barnes & Noble. It's a large, huge books seller. They have hundreds of stores. Each store is as big as the department store all over the country. And when the Internet came, they asked themselves the logical question, how can we benefit from this? And they said, oh, if we can put on online advertising and everything, we can get more people to come into our stores. 
And then there's this other guy named Steve Bezos who says, I don't have any stores. I don't want anybody to come into my stores. I just want to sell books to the world. And he's the largest bookseller in the world, uh, you know, 20 years later. Uh, so I think that uh, what we want right now, what's important, it's not that we are, we haven't, we're not accusing anybody. And, you know, it's not that we won't be proud of some of these people lying up. What we want, first of all, is create a, a center for creativity and new ideas. Going to Berkeley, we had a reason for going there. And that was Alberto's inspiration, and he was very right. We went to the place where the greatest innovation is taking place. Not just virtually Stanford, but, you know, Carnegie Mellon, Root. These are organizations that have been really pioneering new models in education. And we invited them all. And we wanted to learn from them. We have the head of online education at Stanford where Coursera was born, Udacity was born. This has really been, you know, the hotbed of innovation. And he told us in his office, we asked him, you know, how much of the university is involved in this? He said, less than 1% of the faculty of Stanford is involved in the online education. And he said, our surveys show 70% are either highly skeptical or highly resistant to the idea because it threatens the existing model. The last thing we want to do, you know, is start with those who feel the resistance. We want to attract those who really see the need. And so we, we are going to those universities. We have the head of online education at Duke who says she'll participate in anything we do. We want to find the people the individuals who really see the need for change and bring them together and be a focal point for it, and those organizations that do too. And I hope that in the future we have a prestigious list, you know, of, of the type of organizations you're looking for. We have to find the right ones who really can, you know, be inspired, who share the inspiration that are out there. But I think our first responsibility is not to go out and hunt for them. We went to Yokohama to the uh, International Association of University Presidents. We addressed 400, you know, uh, university presidents. And uh, some of them came up and said, this is great. This is the best thing we've heard at the whole conference. Those are the people that we should be talking to. And we know it will take time. Alberto said it's a year old, but actually our first official meeting was at Library of Alexandria in February of this year. You know, we're only a six-month-old. We're a baby. We're less than a baby. We're a, a toddler. <laughs> so, uh, but your point is well taken, and uh, uh, we, we, we are still trying to get our own hands around what role we can most effectively play. The purpose of our talking like this is because we become clearer and clearer about what kind of change is needed. And then, when we're really clear about that, you'll find the partners. The meeting next week, you know, it's not institutions that are coming. It's individuals who are coming who really feel we need a new, a new approach in the social sciences. And to me, that's a, a very important part of this whole thing. So, Right now, we're starting off very modestly, with very modest resources, uh, with uh, more of inspiration, uh, and, and find, looking to find the path. And it's not, uh, it's not totally clear what that path is yet. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.